hello students today i will deal with india china relations now india china relations will be very important for both psir as well as uh, general studies paper 2 the presentation prepared here is meant for both gs students as well as psir students the only difference is that <clears throat> in general studies you need not to quote the scholars but you will have to understand the entire issue so <clears throat> this particular video initially i will first discuss the current state of india china relations and then we will discuss something very focused on galwan clashes and the second important development uh, that is the decision of china to build the mega dam so in 2019 there were three questions from india and china relation one question was on vri second question was on south china sea dispute and third question was on brahmaputra few years back also there was a question on brahmaputra so i think from <coughs> this year's perspective again brahmaputra issue either in gs or in optional they will be asking and the galwan clashes so first of all in recent times we have seen certain events like first at doklam then wuhan rick covid seo breaks indo pacific quad fine so many things are happening around but how to understand the things in perspective fine so somewhere almost all developments relate to the relations between to asian giants india and china now <clears throat> first of all we should not look at the events in an isolated manner every event is interlinked to make sense of the events and to be able to answer the questions from different dimensions we have to understand the things in perspective so today i will put different aspects in perspective with a focus on border dispute and the brahmaputra dam related geopolitics <clears throat> though not required in general studies yet the theoretical understanding of international theories or this international politics help us in making things analytically understandable fine so first of all if a question comes what are the causes behind the galwan clashes what does it point towards the future of india china relations or what has been india's dilemma towards dealing with 
China. So there can be n number of questions. I would like to discuss some of the relevant questions from the previous year papers also so that you come to know how to utilize it. Fine. So now let us understand whether it is a Galvan issue or dam on Brahmaputra or CPEC or China Pakistan axis or quad we have to understand with reference to the word order fine so <coughs> after the end of Cold War what exactly are we witnessing so after the end of Cold War we are witnessing the change in the world order. Change in the world order. And it is essential to understand the world order because the foreign policies of the countries are the responses or adjustments with the world order. So, post second or post cold war world order first of all we can say from 1991 to 2 2001. 2001 means September 11, 2001 is a word of US hegemony. Fine. Now, <coughs> If we go by the polarity of power thesis given by Kenneth Walls or Mir Scheimer, we can always say that unipolarity is never stable because unipolarity results into two things. First thing is the hegemon overstretch itself and the rise of free riders. For example, US as a hegemon overstretch itself and the free riders like China took the advantage of the order WTO and all established by US, Russia, India. EU fine so there is a 
rise of these countries fine now power is <coughs> a zero sum game means if the power of these countries increase the power of us will decrease automatically fine so up till 2001 we see unipolarity and from 2001 till 2008 we see the beginning of the decline of us hegemony so september 11 2001 incident show that certain sections in the islamic world do not support the us led world order after this when you see in 2003 when us started war against iraq us didn't get the support of uh, china russia germany and many other countries and that is why that is called as us invasion on iraq so us failed to generate the consensus in the manner it could get consensus in the gulf war when against saddam hussein or when saddam hussein invaded the kuwait okay now 2008 global financial crisis fine and this marks the distinct it marks the distinct decline of us hegemony thoda sa ac halka kar zyada thanda ho raha the distinct decline of us hegemony to the extent that china could dare to accuse us china could dare to give lecture to us that us model of finance etc is not working and around itself china around itself china built the bricks the first bricks summit took place in 2009 at yeka terenberg now this is a very important moment from where we see the beginning of china's assertiveness and the us policy of asia pivot or rebalance so there is a change of guard in 
USA and Obama came to power and Obama administration launched the policy of Asia Pivot which later on came to be known as Asia Rebalance which came to be known as the Rebalance. Now US has overstretched itself and uh, that is why it was essential that US makes its own house in order. So sometimes what we see the analyst of international politics trying to project as if there is a contrast, big contrast between the foreign policy of Obama and the foreign policy of Trump. So I will say that only the difference is in theatrics. Otherwise, there is not much difference and there is more of a continuity. Sometimes students ask, Biden will come and Trump and there will be a big difference in a foreign policy. So any student of international politics very clearly understand, especially for the countries like US, the foreign policies are not a knee-jerk reactions. Foreign policies display immense continuity. The theatrics may change, the style may change, the sophistry may change, but the fundamentals remain. So from my perspective, I do not see a qualitative change in the policy of Obama and Trump and I don't expect a very fundamental change when Joe Biden will take the charge of the office. Fine. So what we see US in Trump's like during the time of Trump, US withdrawal started from the international affairs. US coming out of the Paris climate deal, US coming out of UNESCO, US coming out of UN Human Rights Council, US not letting WTO dispute settlement body to be to remain functional and uh, uh, Trump talking about America first and withdrawal from different regions. But what is the difference? The things started at the time of Obama. Obama's election issue was withdrawal from Afghanistan, <coughs> withdrawal from Iraq. He is the one who emphasized on Asia pivot, Asia rebalance. In fact, Hillary Clinton held that India is a part of a big plan of Obama. US is making the strategic bet on India. She is the one who talked about that India should not just look east. India should act east. So the ideas like Indo-Pacific, the formulation or formulations like Quad, Indo-US defense partnership, all these things we see has taken place not even at the time of Obama, even at the time of George Bush and it's a bricks by you are building things, you are consolidating 
the things. So, according to me, no serious student of international politics will see a complete break in foreign policies. It is always a continuity and the change. Okay. Now, From 2008 global financial crisis, we see the definite decline of US hegemony. Obama coming to power and US actually started withdrawing 2009-2010 withdrawing from the world affairs to focus on its internal development and the idea of Asia rebalance or Asia pivot. Now, both these policies aimed at containment of China so US officials used to talk about ensuring the rise of China remains peaceful. So, this is the diplomatic language and you understand what exactly we mean by that containment of China and <coughs> containment can also be done by engagement too. So, by this time, it was very clear that China is going to challenge the US hegemony. Now, after 2010 or 9, I don't exactly remember, you can just see Obama coming to power in USA and in 2012, Xi Jinping. coming to power and by this time it was very clear that US is in the state of decline means it is a right moment when China can end. It's hide and bide strategy means hide or peaceful rise and China goes for its assertive policies. Fine. So we see after Xi Jinping coming to power. Chinese or the tensions of China with its neighbors, be it Japan, be it Vietnam, be it Philippines increasing. China as a power started challenging the existing norms, institutions. China denied that it will abide by the verdict of the permanent court of arbitration on the dispute over the islands in South China Sea specifically with Philippines. So this was the time when after Xi Jinping coming to power we see Chinese incursions first in Dalat Beg Oldi then in Chumar and then in Doklam and now in Galwan. Fine. So, China 
thought this is the right time to end the peaceful rise and china went for the aggressive ex, 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 aggressive display of its power okay now if we talk about 2009 the distinct decline of us hegemony and the distinct rise of china Two thousand nine, the COVID crisis fine. It is you can say it. Ha it has been a mot metamorphosis. Fine. So the crisis means a. very clear decline of us no doubt about the decline of us hegemony means this is the first crisis in the world where we see lack of or we see no leadership of us on the world affairs complete us leadership and us actually leaving the field open for china to assert or to display the leadership fine <clears throat> now this entire background show that at present what is happening is the basic framework of reference is us is trying to protect its hegemony and china is challenging not just challenging china is actually bent on displacing us hegemony these are the two frameworks for us to understand anything that is happening in international politics just like after the second world war if we wanted to understand man if we wanted to understand israel palestinian issue or anything we could not have understood without understanding the superpower rivalry during the cold war fine so when we talk about galwan when we talk about brahmaputra or any issue the backdrop is the game or this rivalry or a this challenge or display between us and china where U 
US is trying to protect its hegemony and how US is able to protect its hegemony if we apply the concept of hegemonic stability theory is trying to protect the norms institutions and since US feels that it is unable to protect it is coming out also but as Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific is very very important for US US wants US statesmen keep on talking about the rule based world order or uh, the transparent freedom of navigation and all such things is happening. On the other hand, China is trying to establish its own vision of the world order, its own norms, it its own institutions fine now how do we as a student of international politics deconstruct all these things how do we come to understand this fine so basically before that we have to understand point number one why US wants to maintain its hegemony And the second thing is why China wants to establish its hegemony. So why there is a game going on for establishing or building the hegemony why so this answer to this why we can find the answer in the work of one of my favorite scholar of international politics Mir Scheimer Belonging to the school of offensive realism. Now, according to Mir Shaimar, considering the structure of international politics, which is anarchical in nature, nations suffer from security dilemma. If Kenneth Ward suggests that nations would try to achieve the balance of power, Mir Shimer suggests that nations will try to achieve hegemony or they want to become the preponderant power because that is the only way they can protect, they can secure their interests completely. Okay. So, any country, it is natural for any country to seek hegemony. And if the question is why, because you suffer from security dilemma, 
and if you remember Hobbes or any scholar until unless you have a power which is strong enough you can protect yourself so nations seek hegemony US foreign policy US seek hegemony China seek hegemony and if we deconstruct even India wants its hegemony in South Asia and India is at trouble when China tries to uh, challenge India's hegemony in South Asia and China tries to contain uh, India's rise within South Asia. So be it China, be it US, it is very, very uh, uh, natural for all these countries to seek US hegemony. Why nations seek hegemony? Because on hegemony depends their security, on hegemony depends their prosperity. So the long term aim of US foreign policy, the long term aim of Chinese foreign policy and if we even talk about India and since the time of Pandit Nehru when we were nothing, that time also Pandit Nehru held that India should get its rightful place in the comity of the nations. So what is happening is attempts to US attempt to protect its hegemony and Chinese attempt to displace and establish its hegemony. Okay. Now how how US can prevent China since they are at the distance at a huge geographical distance scholars like Mir Scheimer suggest the policies like passing fine so us can pass the buck or burden on the other countries in the region which are apprehensive of china's rise the most important being india Second is Japan, Australia, Vietnam, Indonesia and so on. That is why in the discourse of US official discourse, India emerges as a ideal swing state which can help in re-establishing the balance and that is why we see strengthening of Indo-US strategic partnership, quad and this entire calculation shows that the Chinese power has become big enough that US alone cannot manage the rise of China. Okay. So in this calculation comes India as a swing state for US and the main country on which US can pass the buck. The other options are Japan, but 
Japan is not a military power. Then Australia. Australia is again having huge economic interdependence. So India is the right country for that. So now what we see is that the center of gravity of international politics has shifted to Asia Pacific and to emphasize the bigger role of India, the term is being used is Indo-Pacific. In Indo-Pacific, what we see, there is a rise of China and China is not rising peacefully. China is registering its presence and whenever we see there is a rise of any power, the other countries in the region have two options. Either to go for balancing means forming a counter coalition like we can talk about Quad for India or going for bandwagoning like India joining BRICS, SU, AIIB and all. So these are the options available. Now how do you look at India's policy? Towards China. So if we talk about the phases of India's policy towards China, then up till 1962, it was a bandwagoning or we can say appeasement of China, India supporting China, even in Korean crisis, India not supporting US-led resolutions. But from 1962 till Rajiv Gandhi's visit in 1988, we see there was a cold peace between India and China. And from 1988 till 2019, we see that these two countries, they have found or established a modus vivendi. All students of political science must be knowing about modus vivendi and the depth of the usage of this particular term. So, when we are not very friendly and somehow we find certain rules of engagement, we call it as modus vivendi, where uh, when we are working together, we are not very enthusiastic about it, but somehow we are trying to find some format where we can coexist. Now, in 2019, amidst the COVID crisis and more strongly in 2020, we see this movet modus vivendi, no more working, no more working and India and China, they require new 
rules of engagement which we can say a new normal of india china relations the new normal of india china relations and the new rules of engagement fine so the question is since xi jinping coming to power in 2012 china's assertiveness and chinese aggression is on rise if we talk specifically about india there have been incursions in dalat beg oldi chumar doklam and now at galwan fine incursions are increasing now how india has been handling these incursions so india has been handling these incursions by engagement with china so the Ch india's policy towards china up till now is known as hedging policy of hedging means india didn't want to become a swing state or india didn't want to uh alienate china or spoil its relations with china india wanted peace and tranquility at the border and that is why indian officials have always been talking about a strategic autonomy or multiple alignments but this is again in a way a code word to show that india is not completely in the league of us or india is not some sort of ally of us and india takes principled approach india is going for multiple alignment india was a spoiler in quad 1 so india going for uh, breaks and sco india china working together at climate change or in wto because india was hedging and uh, india wanted to focus on its own internal development uh whether it is time of pandit nehru or at present we always know on the basis of chinese strategic culture that china does not have a peaceful intention but instead of direct containment india preferred congagement containment with engagement in the sense india improved the strategic partnership with japan korea look east policy with usa but at the same time engaging with china so india's policy towards china is a policy of hedging and
India's policy, how to manage its relations, India relied one on deterrence, second into the summit level talks, formal and informal and third is economic interdependence. Fine. This has been the policy of India. Now as US, China, trade war, tensions becoming more and more acute. US will work in such a way that the balancing act for India will become difficult whether it is China or it is Iran and India will be compelled to make the hard choices. Now how to compel India the offers can range the extremely lucrative offer like India US civil nuclear agreement the promise to include India in Australia group, in Vasinar group, in NSG, promising India a permanent seat in UN Security Council. So you give such things on the platter that it will become very difficult. Plus you have a long term sense of a rivalry towards China, India suffered a humiliating defeat and if India has to choose between US and China, obviously what US can offer is going to be more and there are going to be very fundamental and structural uh, disputes or problems between India and China. So obviously what we see that India going or India going closer and closer into the lap of US, Indian Prime Ministers if see say Bajpayee had no hesitation in saying US as India's natural ally. Manmohan Singh has no hesitation in saying US as India's natural partner and Prime Minister Modi has no hesitation in saying that we have overcome the hesitation of the past and Indian Minister of External Affairs S. J. Shankar talking about that ultimately what kept India far from getting its rightful place is Delhi's dogmas. So if you see his speeches or his Goenka speech, he mentions this. So this is an indication that India is going almost into the state of quasi-alliance with USA. Fine, leaving the dogmas, leaving the hesitations of the past. So India and US entered into the logistical support, logistic support agreement. Now all the four, you can say, the arms agreements with US and 
today the defense cooperation is the main pillar of india us strategic cooperation fine now let us have a view on us india china triangle where india needs us to needs us to balance china fine us sees india as a ideal swing state india sees us as a balancer and china sees us as a main enemy and it sees china sees india as acting as a lieutenant of usa and actually india china relations have never been you can say bilateral us has always been involved be the question of uh, uh, giving asylum to the dalai lama be a tibetan issue and so on so it's a complicated situation but china would also not like us or china would also not like india to go entirely in the league of us so china is also following a policy of containment of india by developing access with pakistan working with india's neighbor as well as engagement with india on certain issues like wto climate change x fine so but china has never cooperated with india on the issues which are of vital importance to india starting with india's entry in un security council india's entry in nsg india's uh, you can say uh, concerns with respect to masood azhar or uh, terrorism emanating from pakistan fine so there was a modus vivendi neither india loved china nor china loved india but they formed a modus vivendi where they were able to work together and uh, india had its own reason not to go entirely into the league of us china had its own reason not to let india go entirely and strengthen the arms of its enemy so a complicated triangle has been there but as china's ambitions are rising a point has come when this modus vivendi those who do not know please look into the dictionary meaning of this beautiful term so the existing modus vivendi is no more workable and the rules of engagement have to be changed so if we see the speeches of foreign minister always pay attention to the key words they always use the rules of engagement have to be changed now 
let us understand china it is natural for any country to seek hegemony fine so if china has to expand itself china is completely contained by us and its allies in the east fine so the only option china has to expand is in the west fine here comes eurasian region if we go by the theories of scholars like alfred t mahan one who controls if you are seeking an hegemony then you must control the oceans now china is relatively weak on the oceans because once the arctic will be frozen the geopolitics will change but right now the us and its allies us harbor spoke system is containing china here india in indian ocean so chinese safest place to expand is in the west and according to mckinder one who controls central asia will control the world now here in its expansion that is why china needed tibet china needed xinjiang and china needed aksai chin the piece of land which connects these two have an all weather road and china has a problem with india and as indo pacific is becoming more and more stronger idea india china japan and all attempting to contain china exploiting china's malacca dilemma wadar port becomes very very important and so for india cpec becomes too important for china and that is a major concern for india because it is a question of india's territorial integrity now china wants to establish its hegemony and china does not want to follow the us led norms or us led world order fine china is challenging the us hegemony now what is like if you want to see concretely in a concrete sense what is us hegemony or what is chinese hegemony so us hegemony is worded in the language of the liberal world order where as china's hegemony is based on concept of middle kingdom complex
Now, if we see India making choices between the two world orders, one is US led liberal international order, second is China led middle kingdom complex. Then India is more comfortable with US led world order where they talk about free and open Indo Pacific or freedom of navigation and China's middle kingdom complex or China's Middle Kingdom complex or Chinese world order. What is the vision of Chinese world order? The vision of Chinese world order is hierarchical world order, which is also authoritarian in nature, means China as over and above the other kingdoms it is you can say as uh, Xi Jinping talks about socialism with Chinese characteristics or Chinese uh, word order means hierarchical word order authoritarian word order which is not transparent which is based on uh, the rules which will be made by China. Fine. So, where do we see the vision of that Chinese world order? We see the vision of Chinese world order in BRI. At times also known as China's Marshall Plan and the code word here used by China is to create the community of common destiny. Fine. So if we see China wants to create a alternative financial system different from the US financial system determined by IMF. China has its own BRI fund, China has its AIIB, Silk Road fund, etc. So, China if you see BRI projects, India's concerns is lack of transparency, lack of clear rules, lack of sustainability. So India's opposition to BRI is actually India's opposition to the Chinese vision of the world order which is a hierarchical vision based on the middle kingdom complex. Okay. Now, for China to overcome its Malacca dilemma, CPEC is very important. Fine. But for India, CPEC is a question of its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Fine. So, India has registered its opposition with respect to CPEC. India has uh, suggested an alternative model that if CPEC does not go from POK, India may participate in BRI, but China not accepting this because China has the eye on Ladakh, China 
is concerned about uh, you can say China is concerned about Aksai Chin and under the government of Prime Minister Modi it has become quite evident for China that India will not compromise with its sovereignty. So now let us take this Galvan clashes. Now what is the immediate trigger for Galvan clashes? The immediate trigger is the road or basically the Galvan Nala which is built by India and it provides the closest point of access to the Indian forces in Aksai Chin. So the proximate cause China opposed India's infrastructure building in the region. Okay. Now, if you see that the proximate cause is obviously China's insecurity and strategically for China, Aksai Chin is very important because it is the only all weather route connecting Xinjiang and Tibet. Fine. And then from Xinjiang to CPEC. Now what we see is that in New Delhi there has been a consistent opposition to CPEC which can be seen as China's which can be seen as China's lifeline because of Malacca dilemma and New Delhi not budging an inch then New Delhi changing the status of Jammu and Kashmir article 370 then India's home minister talking about Pakistan occupied Kashmir new resolve and CPEC goes from here as well as mentioning about Aksai Chin. Fine. So this action of India has hurt the China where or it has attacked China where it hurts the most. Now China is also concerned because the present government in New Delhi is also uh, having a stand of you can say ultra nationalistic. It has a vision of Akhand Bharat. It has taken certain steps which are unprecedented given surgical strike Pulwama. So, it was very obvious for China to have a concern. So, China had having this apprehension that India may have or India may try considering the jingoistic and nationalistic fervor of the government we try to get the Aksai Chin back or suppose India makes any attempt to take 
POK also got knows and uh, there have been the talks in the government of India about changing its nuclear policy, going for first use and the resolve the strong man image of Prime Minister Modi, the image of Jai Shankar and uh, the new confidence in the country and India's deepening of relationship with US. So ultimately and after India's strong resolve at Doklam, so after this COVID crisis and uh, internal challenges, China took this salami and initiative is to test the waters means what is the level of India's preparedness, what is the level of India's uh, resolve in protecting its territorial integrity. China has seen one example in Doklam but as the situations have changed because of COVID and China was expecting that India will be on the receiving end but the presently what we see is new India. There is a new vigor, there is a new confidence in Indian people, in Indian armed forces and China was surprised with India's stand and instead of India on the receiving end, Indian soldiers gave a befitting reply. Indian soldiers captured the strategic heights near uh, Pangong Lake. India taking the strong measures, you can say restriction on Chinese FDI, additional controls on Chinese imports. And a very befitting reply to China by decoupling with Chinese economy and India's decision to stay out of RCEP. Fine. So now this time China is taking a step forward realizing its mistake and is showing greater resolve for de-escalation and disengagement. Second thing is India took the strong decisions. Earlier decision was to maintain peace and tranquility at border but India said it cannot be one-sided Indian forces occupying the strategic heights, India speeding up the infrastructure development at the border, India making firepower in the sense Agni and then strengthening its firepower and even after this Galwan India has purchased Sukhoi and building this in uh, its firepower is strengthening it, inviting Australia for Malabar exercises and then stepping up what coming out of RCEP means India is ready to change the rules of engagement. Fine. So, not going for economic interdependence, strengthening India's deterrence and leaving things on China. So, what we see 
and uh, our foreign minister very clear terms he said that uh, we will not be compelled to go into any sort of compromise and uh, today we can say that uh, yes china is on the back foot and uh, india has a uh, strategic gains out of this battle and uh, india's at least we can say that india has changed the rule of engagement with china so galwan uh, this adventure by china was like testing the water seeing india's resolve that india will be uh, able to defend its position and uh, in the recent months the decisions which we have taken show that india has a strong resolve we have a strong leadership at the center the morale of our people is high uh, india is ha- taking a strategic approach the morale of indian armed forces is i and india is not going to repeat the 1962 and we can definitely say that there can be a gap between chinese power and india's power but we should not forget that china also has its vulnerabilities in tibet in taiwan in hong kong india can also change its one china policy similarly india has its advantage in terms of india's location in indian ocean in terms of india has a demographic advantage in terms of india has been successful in building a discourse against the rise of china india has a stronger allies and if we see the chinese allies they are actually a burden or a liability on china and china is suffering from so much of uh, internal issues we can say a pressure cooker syndrome that is developing in china so obviously we can say that uh, your neighbor is your natural enemy and with china if we look at chinese strategic culture if we look at xi jinping the chinese designs are not peaceful and it is not in the interest of india to go for war with china but the only way to avoid war with china is to end the dogmas and be prepared for war with china the policy of appeasement will never work and india should come out of the dogmas and india should uh, give greater push to quad it's not a time for bandwagoning or hedging rather the right approach for india will be internal balancing and external balancing so this was the brief overview of the state of india china relations now i have prepared a presentation for more detailed understanding of the topic now i will discuss the now <coughs> sorry i will discuss some of the key points which you should keep it in mind so that you can tackle different questions related to india china fine so here is certain quotes of certain scholars well known scholars which you can quote while deciding what should be india's approach what should be china's approach fine so this is a prominent thinker sunzu and sunzu says strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory tactics without a strategy 
is the noise before defeat. So, in context of Galwan, we can say that this statement should have acted as a warning for the government of China itself that Chinese actions in Galwan is like a strategy without tactics and tactics without a strategy and it was a noise before defeat as China <coughs> was on the receiving end. Now, the art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of enemy not coming but on our readiness to receive him. Another word of wisdom from Sun Tzu that in order to avoid war with China, it is always better if India is prepared for war and even if we don't want war, war is inevitable. To subdue the enemy without fighting is the acme of skill. He who wishes to fight must first count the cost. So this time this message is for China. Now, Kautilya, India should never forget the word of wisdom from our thinker Kautilya that your neighbor is natural enemy. Now, war is a continuation of politics by different means. Another my favorite scholar, Clausewitz, and he says that war is a continuation of politics by different means. Means, if I have to deconstruct the Chinese attempts in Doklam or Galwan, I will say that it is less of a military strategy and more of a political aim because uh, these actions of China are not for territory. Basically, these actions of China is to impose or is to carry forward its larger geopolitical objectives. Now, <clears throat> Alfred Mahan, another very prominent thinker, and uh, you should always remember that whosoever control Indian Ocean will control Asia and Indian Ocean is a key to seven seas and India should consistently endeavor to strengthen its maritime footprints. Of course, Mir Shimer, who has warned that China is not a country with a peaceful designs. Now, this is the map of the territorial dispute. You must all be knowing it, but it makes a sense. This part is a McMahon line and Arunachal Pradesh. Now, China is claiming the entire Arunachal Pradesh. This is the Aksai Chin region, area held by China. This is the region ceded by Pakistan to China. This is POK. This is our Siachin Glacier and this is a disputed areas. So China accused India of occupying 90,000 square miles of territory in eastern sector. India accuses China of occupying 38,000 square miles of Indian territory. Now another view, this is Tibet and Aksai Chin area, Ladakh, Siachen Glacier. <coughs> now you must have heard about the two lines, the Johnson line and McDonald line. So, McMohan line is only for the eastern sector at Arunachal Pradesh and here there is no accepted line. Britishers have proposed two lines, either you go for McDonald line or Johnson line. So, if we accept, if India and China both accept Johnson line, entire Aksai Chin will be India's territory, but if they accept McDonald line, Aksai Chin will primarily fall under Chinese territory. Now, uh, in order to understand 
China's uh, desperation for CPEC, China or for that matter any country aims hegemony. Hegemony, China needs its expansion and <clears throat> here Taiwan and all. So China's expansion eastward is uh, limited because of the presence of US Navy and that is why China wants to declare East China Sea, Yellow Sea, South China Sea as Chinese lakes. So the only place for China to expand is in the West and that is why China has occupied Xinjiang and China has occupied Tibet. Now Aksai Chin is very important for China because it is all weather route connecting the two restive provinces and in order to overcome its maritime dilemma especially Malacca dilemma it is very important for China to go for CPEC corridor which goes through POK, Gilgit, Baltistan and after India changing the status of Jammu and Kashmir, China has become concerned. So one of the reason behind China's action. Now <clears throat> always remember uh, this is one view of uh, Mao and he used to say that Tibet is a Chinese farm and Ladakh, Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan and Arunachal these are the five fingers. So India should always be careful about Chinese uh, misadventures in Arunachal Pradesh and Ladakh. Now China has planned six wars in the next 50 year. First war is unification of Taiwan. So a lot of uh, tension is built up between US and China and Taiwan and according to official aims they will be doing it by 2025. Second, Spratly Island. Third, Southern Tibet, that, that is Arunachal Pradesh by 2040. So India should be well prepared. Then Biao or Sen Kaku Island. Then unification of Outer Mongolia. And then taking back the Siberian lands from Russia. <coughs> you should uh, keep track of this 19th People Congress. This is a very important event where Xi Jinping was declared as Supreme Leader. Xi's thoughts are added in Chinese uh, Communist Party's character. He has aimed that China will be a moderately prosperous society by 2021, 100 year of the formation of Communist Party of China. China will be developed nation by 2049, high income country by 2035. By 20, but this is Chinese weakness that 36.5% uh, of Chinese will be above uh, 60 years of age, and this China's made in China policy is also one of the reason for uh, conflict between US and China because China is moving in the innovation based economy. Now just have a quick look on the border agreements. First is Panshil, you must be knowing, peace and tranquility, military CBMs, political parameters and guiding principles which was agreed and finally evolved here. Border defense cooperation agreement in 2020, five point agreement at Moscow. This is the detail of the five point agreement between foreign minister and Chinese counterpart, nothing very substantive. <coughs> now, this is a comparison between Chinese power and Indian power. So in terms of potential power, you say that there is a big gap, but the real power is always tested in the battlefield. So nothing to fear. Now, Galvan clashes. You can say that in short, PLA's objectives have fallen apart in front of India's determined stand. Since she came to power, there were clashes in Depsang, in Chumar, 
in Doklam and now in Galwan. Now, whether the Galwan clashes are the tactical military moves or they are at broader geopolitics. Obviously, it is all about broader geopolitics. Now, if we see a chronology in March, Corona pandemic reaches India. In April, New Delhi announced a plan to manufacture active pharmaceutical ingredients domestically rather than importing China. China starts its salami slicing. China's changing facts on ground, preventing Indian patrolling. June 15, clashes at Galwan. June 18, government announced restriction on BSNL on working with Chinese tech companies. <coughs> The proximate cause of clashes, China objected to the road construction in Galwan Valley, especially the Galwan Nala. Why? Because Galwan is east to Siachen, only point of direct access to Aksai Chin from China. China occupied Aksai Chin in 1962. China withdrew from eastern sector but not from Aksai Chin because China needs space to expand in the west. Chinese apprehensions or reasons for recent clashes, India's changes in the status of Jammu and Kashmir, India's aggressive claims on POK, Gilgit, Baltistan, reference to Aksai Chin by the Home Minister, road will facilitate the quick mobilization of the forces. Uh, so road building, China's confirmation that India may think about Aksai Chin. So this road is providing a quick mobilization to Indian forces, strong opposition to CPEC and BRI in India, heightening tensions with India they thought will bring India to negotiating table for economic bargains as a price for peace and tranquility, to project US as a decaying power and India as a weak power, address the domestic unrest, China understood Indo-US relations have gone too far and there is no point China looks for engagement with India. Beijing was testing the waters and challenging and shifting India on the continental background. So, since India is focusing on maritime area, China wants that India should focus its attention on the territorial part. How was India's response? Indian troops occupied the strategic heights in Chushul sector where they can have eye on Chinese pictures. India reinforced the region with additional workers to assist border road organization and complete the infrastructure. DRDO tested 10 missiles in 35 days, including Rudram 1, reactionary military procurement, including Sukhoi from Russia, lightweight tanks. India took economic retaliation. Cancellation of railway contracts, cancellation of Mumbai monorail contract, additional checks on Chinese imports and staying out of RCEP. Strategic actions which India has taken. India has gone on 4 June mutual, mutual logistical support agreement with Australia, Japan, India, AXA, strengthened strategic relations with Vietnam and Indonesia. Talks. Nine round of talks lost happened on 6 November at Chushul. China made de-escalation proposal. China will go back to finger 8 in north and India will move from 4. Dismantling of war infrastructure, withdrawal from designated location. So since India has reinforced itself, China is worried. Now what is uh, the view of our foreign minister? Situation is complicated but India won't be stampeded into a resolution. Border talk will take long. Like in Sum Do Rong Chu of 1987, it took nine years for de-escalation. It shows that India is not desperate for de-escalation. Now, what are India's challenges and dilemma towards China? China is the most dangerous revisionist power with litany of grievances, overall ferocity, Chinese revisionism cannot be maintained by liberal norms. The current leader of China, authoritarian, considers negotiation as a weak sign of weakness. The, there is one statement that 
way of heaven is profound but the way of mankind is difficult to so dealing with Xi Jinping will not be an easy task. So from hide in by diplomacy, he has shifted towards wolf warrior diplomacy. So China looks at India with disdain, unexceptionalism and aggressive nationalism, Xi Jinping proposes. Chinese strategic culture is aggressive. Mao's approach is create misconceptions, go for a surprise attack. So be ready for surprise attacks and instead of big wars, China prefers salami slicing. China has a four warfare strategies, physical intrusions, psychological intrusions, technological intrusions, cyber warfare and controlling international organization. We have already seen how China has controlled WHO. So these are certain war strategies China is adopting. The gap in power. <coughs> These are also challenges, the gap in India-China power, China's eroding India's internal cohesion, for example, in Kashmir, openly opposing India since 2008, open access with Pakistan and Middle Kingdom complex hierarchical world view, Russia shifting loyalties towards China and Pakistan and China's nuclear expansionism. These are some causes of concerns. Evolution of India-China relations, till 50 absent from each other security calculus, from 1950 to 62 good relations, from 88, 88 the year of Rajiv Gandhi's visit, deep freeze, then they found a modus vivendi, modus vivendi is a term that you will be used for the type of uh, some arrangement we had with China and according to Shiv Shankar Menon, in future, it may be very difficult for us to arrive at new modus vivendi. China's policy, sorry, India's policy towards China, hedging or balancing or bandwagoning up till now, go for deterrence, summit, economic interdependence and not offending China. But now, rules of engagement needs to be changed. What all will come in the rules of engagement? Explore China's vulnerability, revise one China policy, Tibet card, Malacca dilemma, choke China and undermine its political system. India's advantages, India is not without cars, India's location in Indian Ocean, demographic dividend, world accepting India's narrative on China, that China, especially on BRI, U.S. desire to counter China, Chinese disputes with its neighbor, Chinese allies are weak and liabilities, India's prepared net for counter offensive, augmented firepower, improved infrastructure. So what India needs from strategic confusion to strategic clarity? S. J. Shankar in his book India Way writes, India's China policy would be critical for India's prospects and India's challenges. So, India has to go beyond traditional assumption. It is essential to stand on one's ground. Bottom line is, India wants the resolution of border dispute. India will try to seek equilibrium with China. But India has to understand that equilibrium is going to be a process. India should go for objective assessment of gaps, go for internal or external balancing. Search for equilibrium is going to be infinite process. Compel China to accommodate India's challenge, manage powerful China plus India's own price. So these things you can remember and it will give the advantage. Now, the future of India-China relations Shiv Shankar Menon writes, they are going to be new normal, more contentious, more antagonistic, more adversarial, difficult to find the modus vivendi. So, the time of Wuhan and Mamalapuram is over and be ready for the new normal. So don't write in your answers, but I think the direction in which we are moving towards 
uh, China is that uh, this is a very apt poetry from Ram Dhari Singh Dinkar. Hit vachan tu ne nahi mana, taitri ka mool nahi pehchana. Lo me, to le me bhi ab jata hoon, antim sankal sunata hoon, yachna nahi ab ran hoga, jeevan jay yaki maran hoga. So India is now fully determined not to give, not to be on the receiving end. How I uh, go through these points, I think you will have enough content to answer the India-China question from different dimensions. Thank you. Thank you.